Let's do it. So, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Sadar Kabuk. Uh, I am, I believe, the last session before the, the elections and all that good stuff. So I will keep this fairly on time. So um, a little bit about me, about 30 seconds. So I, I've been in the business for about 20 years in IT and security. Uh, the, the thought about today's talk came about uh, between me and Vladimir because I've been uh, doing a lot of uh, major cloud migration adoption programs with, especially in financial services. I typically talk about two use cases. Uh, one of them is cloud. The second one you're seeing is about cloud. The first one is about actually recovery, um, recovery operations. But we will stick with the, uh, the second one. I hear that there's a bit of cracking of voice. Can I just have a quick sound check if this is all working for you? Okay. So, um, as I said, I've done a few of these major cloud adoption programs. And today, what? Sorry, said um, I think, do you want to try, I think it's headphones issues we had this earlier. Do you want to try just using your default? Um, Let me do that. Speakers, yeah. mic from your PC or laptop. Is it better now? Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll leave. Thank you. We can go on mute. You might want to check the settings uh, to select the correct uh, audio source. How about now? Yes, good. All right. Third time lucky, Vladimir. <laughs> yes. All right. So the, these numbers on these use cases show the security teams and investment and number of years it's taken to either run a major recovery operation. My good colleague talked about resiliency in the past, and this is obviously when not hit, not Petya hit three and a half years ago. That's not what we're going to be talking about today. On the right, you see the cloud use case, which is all about uh, taking a major corporation into the cloud and a major outsourcing business. And as you can see, it was a rather successful case with having 40, 50 different security individuals working on this uh, transformation program. It took them at least a couple of years to get uh, the, uh, the, the migration up and running. And it cost, obviously, uh, the, the budget was in the order of multi tens of millions pounds. So what I will be talking about today is literally just walking you through the approach that this client has taken with some help from uh, ourselves at that time and look at some good business, uh, good lessons learned for what works actually, because it obviously was a successful cloud migration program. What this talk isn't going to be is, is it's not a let's say a blueprint of what a cloud adoption should look like from a technology and technical point of view. It is rather focusing on the approach and some lessons learned on how to get the security teams engaged maybe early on and what are the different steps that we think the security teams should be involved, almost like a checklist. So I would leave it to you to see what you can take out of this talk, just going through the case. So we'll talk about the client first. Then I'll talk about the approach and how we run this with the client. And then we'll talk about the outcomes and what was achieved and lessons learned. But before I start, I mean, in my cloud engagements, I've typically come across the two types of security teams. And in my experience, again, purely personal level, one of them works better than the other one. The first group is typically the ones who would actually talk mostly about what you can't do on the cloud. It's all about which workloads you can't put on the cloud, what mechanisms don't work, focusing on pretty much why it's not a good idea in the first place, and focusing also pretty much on what are the risks. Now, the positive about this is this raises awareness. The not so positive about this approach is obviously, A, um, you may be seen as a blocker, and B, you may be left behind. And typically I've seen the second option that security left, gets left behind with that option. The second group of people are more about 
okay, so what is the art of the possible and what can we put in the cloud and how can we actually work around it to, so that we actually do that with the uh, risk mitigation. And this group actually is more about how to mitigate risks and even actually enable the business to put more things on the cloud securely. And these teams I've actually seen more embedded and in a more, let's say, positive and they get more interaction with the business who is obviously looking at getting best return on investment on the cloud. So those are the two groups either being part of the problem or a solution. So this client was a, a high street brand, uh, quite a big uh, high street brand in the UK. Um, very traditional, insourced everything. Uh, even this, the, you know, the all functions, IT functions were insourced. Very little managed services, very little outsourcing. So it's a big heritage of cultural change that needed actually to move this client from an internal view into, into a more cloud outsourcing based approach. The reason they actually wanted to move in the end was because of the business pushing for two things. One, they wanted to control costs. If you have a security function of almost 300 people, including service desk, all in source, that tends to be a fairly expensive uh, ordeal. So they wanted to see if there can be a better cost uh, option for them going into a cloud and outsourcing option. Secondly, they wanted to focus IT on more on the higher up in the stack, meaning more innovation, more, more expenditure for uh, high-end um, agile uh, business applications rather than focusing on the infrastructure and more of the commodity IT services. And they, after years of no appetite for cloud migration, they had one executive come in as a CTO and they were able to drive this change through. Of course, what are the complications? The culture of the company was mostly about not, not outsourcing anything. And there were a couple of, a number of legacy IT applications and services that obviously is not easy to migrate to the cloud. And thirdly, this company is highly in a highly regulated industry and they needed to please regulation very much so. So what well, this is the blueprint of the approach that was used. And I can go and be bold to say, if your cloud migration adoption does not include these three steps, which doesn't need to run in waterfall, it can be run concurrently. I would say there is either a chance of that uh, program failing or your business may not get the best benefit out of that cloud investment. So typically, we want to see three things in a cloud adoption program. One, coming up with a good case of so why you're doing this and what is the return on your investment and what is actually the, 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 um, the value proposition of going to the cloud. And that will pretty much drive what parts of your business that you need to take into the cloud. That actually takes me to the second point. There is actually a big people aspect of the cloud, which we, in this case, call the cloud competency center. And this is all about what are the functions that are going to remain on premise? What are the functions that are going to be outsourced to the cloud service provider? And you need to be very clear about this operating model that how it's going to be done. Most of the stuff that fail after a cloud adoption is because of the lack of roles and responsibility division between the cloud service provider and the client. And if you have a major incident like NotPetya, working with an outsourcing provider, cloud service provider, in that scenario, it's a major, major nightmare. So you need to look at your target operating model. And thirdly, it's the cloud migration. That is the part that most people think about, like what is the enterprise architecture? What's the technical architecture? What are the tools and technologies? And what are the workloads are we going to migrate to the cloud? That is the first thing that people think. But without one and two, it is actually not going to be very effective. And in our approach, I think we ran these things mostly concurrently. So it wasn't like we were going to wait for six months for a strategy and then run the second and third options. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you some um, elements of the approach that we think security should be part of. Initially, there's always a feasibility study of to see what is basically going to be uh, the, the benefits of going to the cloud. 
Now, I want to say that there are obviously, even though cloud is inherently less secure environment because you basically put in your, um, you know, you basically don't have the physical security to start with. There are some security benefits that you should uh, be focusing on and driving uh, and going into that feasibility study. And that could be, for example, if uh, allowing a CIO or a CTO of your, of your company to put more things on the cloud in a secure fashion. So you need to show them that if you can do X, Y, and Z, that they can actually potentially put more workloads on the cloud or come up with a better um, migration plan that will actually accelerate their cloud adoption. So security should be definitely part of that feasibility study. And But you need to be very clear about what your value proposition is. If security is all about we need to buy extra things, we need to add these controls, and it's going to cost us this much, then that's where actually the business starts uh, leaving security behind. Secondly, I think driving a cloud risk assessment is very key here, kind of understanding what are the different risks you are facing here. And without that, it is going to be hard for you to convince the business. Thirdly, I would say engaging with the regulators early on because they were always the favorite subject that they will ask about cloud is obviously apart from whether you've done your risk governance is whether you have the right security controls around. If your risk is data, if your risk is resiliency, they are going to be asking you questions. And this also goes back to the operating model. They would like to understand who is doing what exactly, especially when things don't go, go, go well. Two regulatory areas you need to be very careful on are Data, obviously, with GDPR and data residency, but also resiliency uh, when it comes to PRA and Bank of England uh, looking after the operational resiliency after cloud migrations. So this is a big topic. If security is not included in this, in this phase, it is very unlikely that they will be included in the latter phases. So the second is all about, and again, in this operating model for this client, uh, to do what is the actually target operating model for the uh, transformed organization. So there are going to be some functions that are on, on premise. For example, you could potentially uh, outsource part of the vulnerability scanning function or vulnerability management function, but there's always going to be something about you knowing your business applications better than the cloud service provider. So coming up with that kind of separation of who is doing what, especially around things like incident management, especially things are around patch management, it's key for the cloud migration to succeed. And here, I think it is on, uh, on us to convince our good colleagues in IT and in the IT department to be part of that security tower definition and work with that security operating model to create something that is going to be workable. And the second thing is here is obviously testing these processes uh, later in the, in, the, in, in the day. And of course, it all comes down to migration. Uh, there will be eventually a migration strategy of what goes on the cloud and what kind of cloud it goes on to, whether it's public or private or hybrid. Uh, again, security has also a good say in this one. You can come up with, um, obviously, a phased approach to say you don't necessarily put your most critical applications, most critical data uh, sitting on them as a first thing. You could actually influence the migration strategy to fit into your risk appetite. And that will eventually drive your technical architecture of how this is going to work. Now, there is going to be an ongoing question around what are the benefits that you are realizing by going to the cloud? And one thing that I don't see our security teams doing often is there are benefits of security from the cloud. So you could potentially get an upgrade of your security technology by leveraging something maybe better provided by the cloud service provider. And this is especially true for you know, small, small to medium enterprises. They will not have the best of breeds, for example, security technologies. So, you could potentially convince that there is a benefit of a better improved security by leveraging the technology provided by the cloud service provider. But somebody needs to ask the question. And of course, it needs to be also baked into the, um, the business case. 
Now, in this client example, um, just going back to the timeline, I mean, this was a major, obviously, uh, cloud adoption. Um, I can tell you the operating model wise, they were still very reluctant to put anything from security function onto a you know cloud service provider responsibility. So the initial phase was all about, we're gonna keep all of our security functions, but eventually and slowly that changed and that's why a phased approach is useful. So this thing started at six to eight months, 18 months, but then even after two years, we were looking at updating the operating model. So one of the things that we, can, we, we, we were able to succeed with getting security included was, again, having that um, positive view of if you can do these things securely, you can potentially put more things on the cloud and we can convince your risk and compliance function that this is a good, a good idea and they can convince the regulator that this is a good idea. And if you can establish that chain, then you can actually show to your CIO that we actually got maybe 20% more workloads on the cloud than we in initially envisaged. And we did a study about this at that time. And the initial plan, the migration plan was 20% fewer workloads on the cloud. And after demonstrating that we can do things securely, that actually was a better return on investment from that point of view. Going into a phased approach is key here. Again, um, not looking at things black and white. Uh, initially, yes, you can choose to keep everything on-prem. It's nothing wrong with that. But eventually, I think as you prove the concept, it is important that you can actually slowly embed uh, more, you know, more, more of, or transform more of your functions into a cloud service provider. One of the things that we were at big advocates of at that time, and that was successful for this client, was eventually you're going to end up with a hybrid situation. If you're going to have something always on-prem, it could be mainframes, it could be core banking systems, whatever you call them. Um, and there are other things that can go on the public cloud. So eventually, in most of my migrations, I've seen a hybrid cloud option here and also multi-cloud. You will eventually end up using several uh, cloud service providers. So the, the idea here is that don't stick with one option whether that's A or B, I think eventually you will move on to A. And that actually is a good way to also satisfy the regulators to see that, that you're convincing them that you are uh, looking after your controls and operating model. And obviously this client was very happy because they were also uh, ticking the boxes on the operational resiliency by uh, going through this uh, approach. One thing, obviously looking at the success factors, um, the, there were three things that really helped uh, getting security. Again, apart from the positive language and um, you know having a clear value proposition, the other thing that really helped is uh, obviously having a team, a security team who knows about cloud rather than having a generic security team talking about the traditional security functions and traditional security tools. And obviously embedding them into the IT teams in a multidisciplinary team was very useful as well. So if you are looking at cloud and you know convincing your IT functions, getting security teams in, make sure that they have their cloud jargons and cloud education complete and they have the cloud skills to talk about rather than just talking generically about security. Um, I talked about phasing, it was a multi-year outlook. So we, we looked at it in a phased approach we didn't do a big bang, which was actually very useful from also a cultural fit. And again, going back to the right organization was very important. So in summary, what helps? Um, uh, for me, it starts with the positive attitude. I think many, many security teams or risk teams eventually want to almost swim across, you know, against the tide here. If, you know, it is clear that we will be on the cloud um, and it, it's inevitable. I think this client that I was talking about today, they resisted it for about at least, you know, five years that I've been helping them in different different functions. And it took them, uh, again, one uh, executive to drive this forward and having a major transformation of their functions. And obviously that 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 is a big cultural shift. But having the security, helping that transformation and rather than be the ones who are always 
uh, being the blockers uh, of change. I think that that's very important. When cloud adoption happens, it happens very quickly. So they, uh, when 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 businesses decide going on the cloud, uh, I've seen that there there's there's going to be many steps they're going to be jumping, and I think it's very important that um, you know having that attitude to also not slow them down. One thing that I would say, one thing is going to slow things down is if your organization doesn't consider any of this and on the 11th hour they get the question from the regulator and they have no answer to it. And thankfully, in this case, this client did get the, the questions from the regulator on the 11th hour before signing the contract with the cloud service provider, but they were able to convince them that this is a good idea. Um, clear value propositions, I think, very important. I think I would, if I were in your shoes, I would talk about not just about risk reduction, not just about compliance. You can talk about compliance. You can talk about GDPR, data residency, resilience, but talk also about some of the KPIs that can help um, cost reduction or that can help return on investment improvements. And I think it's not easy to find them in security. I'm fully aware of that. But there are also elements that I think it's just a little bit out, outside the box thinking uh, that you need to you need to convince that these can be the case. It could be an upgrade of getting a better security from the cloud, uh, and then that's also another way to convince your security people if they see an upgrade. Yeah, that's a combination of carrot and stick approach. Technical aptitude. We talked about security teams so often talk about generic generic security and not necessarily specific to you know, AWS or Azure and what works with them. Um, I, I've seen actually security teams work really well when they're embedded within the IT. If you're designing a target operator model, you don't need to do it on the side that needs to be in, in, included in your IT, IT team. And we talked about a phase approach, but eventually, unfortunately to say, but it all comes down to having a good sponsor in security if we are not at the table uh, when the feasibility studies are done or when the business cases are built, we're not going to be at the table at the, at the end. And final thing for me said to say is um, we often do a lot of black and white thinking, especially when it comes to risk. I think there's a lot of shades of gray here and there's a lot of phasing that we can build and still be um, built a resilient cloud organization but maybe do that gradually and not necessarily um, in a big bang approach. So I will pause here. That was the story of this client. If there are any questions I can take in the next five minutes. Thanks, Serdar. Yes, we have, uh, we have some questions uh, uh, from Dmitry. We have a question about the human kind of factor, um, you know, that affecting all those three phases, you know, factors such as, you know, uh, fear of loss of uh, jobs, you know, as, you know, the workloads are moving to cloud, the some of the teams may not be needed, uh, you know, and need to get in more. So how, how was the, this affecting your case study and how, yeah. how did your team manage that? that that's a, that's a very, that? good, very good question. And I will answer it in two ways. Uh, one of them is the fear of losing your job as an executive, which is, I think, something that I'd like to mention uh, because I, I have a bit of a story about that. But coming back to the whether we would lose out some of the functions. Now, there are typically there is typically big HR involvement, in, especially in, in the target operator model design, and that's done across the, across the whole organization, and not just about security, of course. Um, so there is definitely an HR involvement there, and eventually, yes, there is going to be some commodity IT services. Take serve, uh, help desk, or take maybe uh, some of the automation around some of the IT services that they will eventually go on to a, uh, let's say, a, a CSP or an outsourcing provider. So that is uh, eventual. But I think the typical answer to this is, and this is similar to all of our executives talking about AI and automation, is if you are in a job area that, let's say, if you're a SOC analyst, and if you're thinking about, oh, whether I'm a level one SOC analyst and my, my, so my job can be outsourced in two years, I would strongly advise you to think about moving up the stack, right? You're not going to be a SOC analyst forever, or you're not going to be a help desk. I think there are a lot of new type of jobs like threat hunting, or you know, you could be on the proactive uh, analytics. 
So I think my advice to those people who are fearing about losing jobs because of automation or outsourcing or cloud migration is to think about the next level of interesting jobs that are coming because of those things. So jobs are not going away. They are just changing into a bit more interesting and a bit more uh, uh, jobs that are that require human intervention. For example, if you're doing, as I said, vulnerability scanning and, 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 and patch management, nobody knows your business better than you in your organization. So there's eventually going to be somebody that you need to be working in the organization as a CSP who knows about the applications. Now, another interesting topic, and I just want to talk about this very briefly, and there are also executives like CIOs and CTOs who, who, who I did speak to at some point, and they were, they were also worried about losing jobs, but not because of not because of going to the cloud, but because of if something happens, I will be the responsible party if something like NotPetya happens. How do I make sure that I, I um, keep my job when the verbatim hits the fan, right? And my answer to them is really around the previous topic, assume breach, right? Think about you're in a situation that you are already in breach. What would you do at that point that you can do now and that really is all about, obviously, having a good response plan and a recovery plan. And that will save a lot of executive jobs. But again, assume breach is a very good way of also keeping your job if you're a CIO. Great. Uh, I've got probably one more question. Uh, we, don't, we don't have any questions from, uh, from the audience yet, but let me... Let me ask the same one I probably had at the panel uh, that we had in London, and that is, you know, it's very good, you know, to to move to cloud for specific workloads, typically not the migrate, but you know, create you know, re-architect your applications. Some businesses are then finding out that some cloud providers are better than others for various services. So some, it kind of leads into multi-cloud scenarios as well. Um, but of course, the security team has been you know, for ages looking at the internal systems, internal network, internal processes. Now they need to multi-skill, you know, um, and that's that's not easy, uh, of course. Uh, suddenly to to need to find out, you know, intricacies how the AWS, Azure, or GCP or other, you know, uh, work. How how was that uh, kind of handled? Because there's a clear skill shortage and uh, the, there's no infinite time of course yeah and I, I i think it's a good question and i think i don't have the 100 percent answer for you the way that it was handled in this client was obviously there was a specials team flow flowed in to help with the during the special transition and as they go into transformation those skills were either uh, you know passed on to the team or you know they became part of the uh, the the actual uh, the 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 end state basically. So some of them actually stayed and, and became the. So for me, it's uh, if your client, if, if your organization is talk, thinking about, um, you know, a cloud, cloud adoption, and um, if they're running through this phase, uh, phased approach, I think there will be time for you to ed educate yourself on the skills of the type of cloud that you could be going into. And I, I look, I'm, I'm currently working with an organization, it's a bank. And I know that their, their IT strategy is moving towards one of the cloud service providers. So if I were in one of the IT teams, I would obviously uh, th think a little bit ahead of the game and say that actually this is probably a good set of skills that I would learn. And you typically want to um, be ahead of that. But in major cloud deployments, as I said, there's usually a need of a specialist team to help out, especially the existing team. Going back to the previous question, you know, how does the, the internal culture affect the cloud migration? It becomes a major blocker, right? I think, as I said, this client did not move a single function of security into the cloud in the first 18 months until they've seen that they have the cap capability and they have the skills and they have the appetite. And that actually happened on a, on a Facebook. So answering your question, mm -hmm. I would, I would definitely think about, you know, what your, what, you know, a little bit looking ahead uh, and see what are the upcoming, what's your IT strategy going towards. 
if you've bought Office 365, I mean, the, typically the next thing is the enterprise server uh, service going into Azure, for example, right? Yeah. And secondly, I think uh, do it on a phased, phased, phased manner. Excellent. Thanks, Sardar. Um, where people can find you if, if they want to you know, have further discussions? Um, so my, uh, my, my you, you can always send me an email. It's uh, my name dot last name at gmail dot com, and mm -hmm. we can continue the discussion. And I can tell you a little bit about the other case as well. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, have Thank a good you. day and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Bye bye.